as most of you probably know my name, I'm Fred Oakley. I'm with the Association for Great Stone Studies, which is a national nonprofit, and there's one of our members here. And, and uh, I do a lot of conserving old gravestones here in Hadley and, and other locations. We use the term conserving because you can't really restore an old gravestone. I know some people using botulism or something to restore their faces now, <laughs> but old gravestones sitting out here for three or four hundred years simply don't uh, respond to uh, to some of our uh, uh, human-related uh, opportunities, shall we say. So the conservation process is to give the stones, uh, shall we say, a longer appearance in life because gravestones are not forever. Just remember that gravestones are not forever. There are all kinds of natural forces, there are hurricanes, there are storms of all types, heavy winds, uh, and, and the chemistry of gravestones is such, as we'll show you in a few minutes, the chemistry of many of these gravestones is such that just the natural water flow. You've been in caverns before and you've seen satellites and satellites, that stalagmites and help me with the other one, whichever, and, 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 and essentially they're all um, um, water-based, and, and the consequence of that is they can be eroded by water, which a lot of these stones are. They are eroded by water and time. And when the wind blows, uh, here in Hadley particularly, there's a lot of soil in the wind. You know, when we're plowing, so all of that comes into the wind, and it does actually add to the erosion effect. So we've got a bunch of stones. When you come into an old grave, graveyard like this, this is a 1790, is it? And Old Hadley is 1759. So you pick 41 years plus, uh, it's 130 years. Old Hadley Cemetery was used for 130 years before this cemetery was used here. And oftentimes, as we read in Judd's history of Hadley, many of the um, deaths in the upper part of the river here, they were floated on a little barge or a boat or something down the river across the fields and buried in the old Hadley Cemetery. Hmm? So that's, that was a means of transport that was uh, quite readily available. So what we're going to begin with here is, um, oh, incidentally, the, the, the sun behind here denies us the use of what we call a mirror. And we use a mirror oftentimes to read the epitaphs. There's a big mirror over there, which we use when we're photographing gray stones. And what you do is you catch the sunlight and you rake the stone with the reflected lamp and you, what you're doing is getting shadows into the inscription and oftentimes you can read the inscription by using a mirror uh, rather than uh, trying to use it uh, straight eyeballing. And this is a very important adjunct when you're recording gravestones. Having a mirror, you also need a little pail of water and you need a scrub brush, and I'll show you that effect right at the end. Is that a plain mirror? No, this is a mirror mirror. It's the plain old mirror. And if you're just doing genealogical work, a little hand mirror will do it because you're not trying to read the whole stone at once. When you're photographing the stone, it's very important to see the whole stone, then you need a biggie. It's this one. And oftentimes, gray stones are underneath the trees and never get any sunlight on it. Well, you can cast the sunlight hundred yards with a big mirror and what you're doing just getting off into the into the area and getting a good reflection so I'm going to put this down now and so we're going to begin our tour right here right here Jim would you take this and in case you get thirsty just <laughs> <laughs> this is the earliest stone here in this cemetery and I want to tell you, as we go through here, there's a huge amount of history. There's uh, uh, religious beliefs are re reflected here, the causes of death. And when you record all of the details on the gravestone, you can determine when people by, by death dates, you often find that there was a uh, major effect from diphtheria or, or uh, yellow fever or uh, the whole variety of, of uh, diseases that were so uh, uh, death dealing back in those days because they really didn't have any a cure for them. As a matter of fact, a number of people died of diphtheria. And when I was four, I had diphtheria. 
but I had a, an injection, and that uh, that's why I'm here. Aren't you lucky? Yeah. <laughs> this is the very first stone right here. It says, A Memory of Abigail, daughter of Mr. Jarius and Mrs. Abigail Congdon, who died May 27th, 1790, in the fifth year of her age. You're going to find a lot of early deaths here of children because uh, the various uh, problems associated with childbirth and of course um, we didn't have any prenatal care and the consequence of that is that many of the children died very very young. So this is our very oldest and very first stone here in this particular cemetery and as you notice the material is slate, the carving is incised and it's beautifully done and that little thing up here in top see we just call it a soul effigy. It's a little face, a little decorative material around it. Will the printing on slate last longer than the Well, you know, uh, actually, I find that in large part, yes, it seems to be, except in granite. Uh, slate s seems to hold much better, and slate, incidentally, is a, is a um, I call it hard mud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And of course, it was down there for many years, and, and it metaphor, metamorphosed from, from the kind of material that was laid down into a harder material called slate. One of the interesting things about slate is it took a long time to lay down, uh, and, and the consequence is that often other materials got in between it, and so oftentimes when you see it parting, it parts right on a, on a fault line. And probably it's clay or ash or something of this nature. But this is the earliest stone that we have in the cemetery, 1790 and 1790. So, if we step right over here, this particular material is called schist, S-C-H-I-S-T. It's sort of a form of granite and it's really not a, not a very good stone at all. That is in terms of holding, you know, the inscription, but it's pretty badly eroded. And here's a little soul effigy with, with all kinds of stuff around it, like um, like as an aura or something about it. And uh, somebody wanted to know if an animal was digging here, and I said, no, it happened, <laughs> happened to be Fred. <laughs> and why did I dig? Why did I dig? To read it. Right. The inscription, or the epitaph, oh, yeah. is below grade. The inscription usually is a name, address, telephone number, email address, you know, all this kind of good stuff in the early part here, and down below, the other part is called an epitaph, and it's usually, sometimes it's a religious phrase, sometimes it's a poem, there's a whole variety of sources for these little epitaphs. And this is Mr. Archibald Ferguson, not Ferguson, but F-O-R-G-U-S-O-N, who died February 19, 1793, in the 76th year of his age. And interestingly enough, Focus in here. Oh, uh, and his epitaph down below says this. I turned two bridges. It says, "Readers, that's you. Behold, as you're you're alive. Well, you are alive. So was I. Am I as now? So you must be prepare for a death and fall, O me." When they started it, it had FOL on one line and sort of ran out of space, and he put the OWME on the next line down. <laughs> when we were recording Greystones, we record them exactly as the carver did them. Uppercase, lowercase, um, uh, and mixtures thereof. So what we try to do is when we record Greystones is be as authentic as we possibly can be with the inscription there. This is Mrs. Ferguson right next door, and her stone is so badly eroded that I couldn't get a thing off of it except I know it's Mrs. Ferguson. F-O-R-G-U-S-O-N. Oftentimes we say Ferguson, we know Ferguson, right? But we don't know Ferguson, but this is F-O-R-G-U-S-O-N. Okay, we're going to move from this particular... Incidentally, the only way that we can really do something about this thing is I lift it up with a tripod because it's very heavy stone. We're talking um, 400 pounds. Ah. Yeah? Oh yes. The stuff is heavy. And put uh, straps on it, you lift it up, prepare a different base and set it down so the inscription and the epitaph are above grade. That is above the soil. Line. What are the little black ones behind it? Big it, Biden? What are the little black this ones? This one right here? This one right here? This yeah. is a footstone. 
the, most of the time in, in colonial times you had a headstone and a footstone. And when you read the stone, you stood in front here and read the stone. And the body was over here. And why was that? What's that direction that way? East. On the day of resurrection, bodily resurrection, you rise and face the sun on the day of resurrection. So the body is over here, so there's a footstone here, and the footstone really belongs out there. And why is it close to the headstone? That helps with the mowing. <laughs> okay, let's go over here. As we go through here, occasionally you might look and see pictures on the gravestones. That's not photographs, but uh, we'll uh, just talk about a few of those. These are infant burials along here. These are slates. Oftentimes, when you see, there's two children there, two children there, one child here, and three children right here. And this one right here, I brought this along. See Aleppo, Aleppas, right here, died 7 November. 1803, aged 14 days. Unusual thing about this is that there's a, um, a subscript on it that says, born October the 24th, 1803, and he died 7 November, so it was just 14 days. There's also Rufus. Rufus died on the 7th of March, 1807. He was nine years of age. And Rufus II, they were going to get a Rufus, right? Rufus II died February 1st, 1808, aged seven weeks. So they were unsuccessful in getting a Rufus or even perhaps even uh, any of the children to survive. And just another interesting sidelight, Mitch, we pulled off, pushed off right on time, so you'll have your say in just a few minutes, if you will. These were sons of John and Mrs. Irene, H-I-B-B-A-R-D. John Hibbard, died September the 1st, 1853. He married in 1792 Irene Belding of Whateley. They had, hold on now, 16 children, 109 grandchildren, and 52 great-grandchildren. So uh, <coughs> they left a whole bunch of Hibberts, and most of them are here. <laughs> so the three children here uh, obviously didn't survive uh, almost infancy. So moving on down here, I chose this section of stones here because this is a different stone material right here. If we if we did have sunshine, yes? I have to read Hebert. Not Hebert. Spell. H-E. Was that an H-E rather than H-I? Thank you. I'll have another look at it. This particular stone type here, you have when, when you're recording stones, that's, sometimes you have a real difficulty reading. But thank you, I'll look at that. This particular material is called sandstone. Down in New York City, they call it brownstone. It's a, uh, it's very a very soft, soft stone. Very soft, yeah. And if you'll notice here, how it tends to separate along fault lines. And this stone probably could be stabilized, but it's, uh, it's on its way goodbye. Oftentimes what falls off right at first is the whole front part with the little uh, epitaph or the, uh, the sole effigies or the iconography up at the top, and then the words start falling off. And this one says, in memory of Elizabeth, daughter of Mr. Daniel Bartlett Jr. And this is L-O-U-V-I-S-A. Well, Carver sometimes used a V, and, and it really translates to a U. Louisa Bartlett died July 29th, A.D. 1807, aged four months. Twenty-four. Mm -hmm. Very early deaths. Right next door here is, uh, let's see, right next door. Is this Benjamin Smith? No, this is Dwight. This is Dwight here. This is slate. Notice right away, going to slate right here. We've got a few parting lines here. And this is Dwight, son of Mr. Daniel and Mrs. Louisa Bartlett, was drowned 25 May 1809, age three. Doesn't say where he was drowned, but he was drowned. Doesn't say if somebody drowned him or the child just fell into a pond and drowned. 
So the circumstances around his death are not revealed on the gravestone, but perhaps if there is a report in the Daily Hampshire Gazette, Daily Hampshire Gazette of the circumstances, then you might find out if the child was in a boat on the river with his father or grandfather and fell over the side and was, was swept away. I often like to just show the ladies some of the <coughs> interesting names. <coughs> this is Submit right here, wife of Paul Wright, and uh, you know, I like the title, <laughs> except I'm married to Rosalie. <laughs> okay, we want to step right around here, if you will. Yep. Midge? You want to help me here? Uh, I'll, I'll take care of these and then we'll move on down there. Uh, incidentally, this stone here is for Jason Stockbridge. The Stockbridges were in town last week, was it, Midge? Yes. A week or so ago. They annually come to town. The Stockbridge School, Stockbridge Street, they're all of the Stockbridge name for the Stockbridge family. Here's Jason over here. And if you'll notice that Jason looks different than this one and this one, that's because I cleaned this stone. I cleaned it with water and a scrub brush, and then added uh, some material called uh, shock. It's calcium hypochlorite, not bleach. Calcium hypochlorite. Bleach is sodium hypochlorite. We do not repeat. We do not use bleach on gravestones. We do not use bleach on gravestones. We use sodium hypochlorite, calcium hypochlorite, because this is a calcium aegis stone. And what you're looking at is many, many millennia ago when the whole earth was covered with water, you know, the, what we call our country was underwater. And, and all those little shells and little sea creatures that were basically made of calcium, they all died and they got squashed, you know, way down below. And, and when the pressure got on it, the material really became limestone. And then when the pressure got greater and greater as water and other levels of soil and rock got on top of it, it metamorphosed. That means changed its form from limestone to what we call marble. And marble is a soft stone. Everything you see here is called soft stone. Measure of hardness, about three. Granite is about eight or nine. And some of you ladies have the hardest of all. Help me. You have it on your hands. Diamonds. Diamonds. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, what a struggle to get there. Well, <laughs> well. Uh, here's another interesting. Here's Abigail. She was the wife of Jason Stockbridge. And here's Esther Wright, who was the wife of Jason Stockbridge. So he had two wives. This one predeceased him. And then this, this one died in... Uh, two, well, this one was 32 years of age. This was his first wife. This was his second wife. Jason Stockbridge lived up uh, on the corner of Stockbridge Road, where the Mercedes lived, in that big house. Uh, that's that's where all the family lived. And and Jason was Jason was Jason was. Uh, the second deacon of our church in 1834 to, uh, he was deacon for 33 years anyway, uh, and he was the father of Levi Stockbridge, who founded Stockbridge School and was the third president of New Mass Agriculture, New Mass Aggie, as you call it. And, uh, Jason and Levi were both very uh, prominent people in town as well as at our North Hadley Church. And would you like to notice this? Look at his title. Deacon. 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 Yeah. Not Mr. Not Jason, Deacon. but Deacon. And back in those days, deacons were a very powerful force in our meeting houses. It wasn't a church. It was a meeting house, right? It wasn't really a church until about 1841, actually 1835 is what 
the separation of church and state uh, was affected here in the Commonwealth. And before that, it was a meeting house. And the deacons, in effect, were sort of like, um, would you say they were sort of like the select board now, but even more powerful. If they toss you out of church, you didn't get the vote anymore. That's in public <laughs> affairs, not just in, so you had to behave yourself. You had more power than Thinnerman has now. <laughs> if you notice here, that's known as this, I clean that one. Here are the three, three children from the first wife. One here, one here, and one here. And out from the second wife is the third child. Here's a little uh, floral design here. This is right here. Well, you see more of those. It's called an urn and willow. When you come into an old cemetery, and this is fairly old, when you come into an old cemetery, you'll see a lot of urn and willows. That was a, a, a death symbol. It was Victorian, and they came into vogue just at the turn of the 19th century. So if you see an urn and willow, you can bet your bottom dollar that the date on that stone is 1800 or later. Occasionally, you'll get a 1799, maybe a 1798. But 99.99999% of the time, it's an 1800 or later. So the three children of the first wife and one child of the second wife are very right along here. And they have an inscription on top or flower. Well, this yeah, this is like this is a little. We call this the iconography of the picture on the stone. Yeah. It's a little flower with a broken stem. Hmm. Many times when you look at. Uh, I don't have an obelisk here with a column on it. Oftentimes you'll see a column with the top looks like it's been broken off and it's done deliberately. That means in the white. Okay. And I wanted to show this one right here. Let's see. Let's see. Where's my Benjamin Smith? Did I miss Benjamin? Feels like Slate's wife. Benjamin Smith. I'm missing Benjamin Smith. Where's Benjamin Smith? Have I got another flag around here? Hmm? Yeah, but that's that's not the one I'm looking for. I've got a Benjamin Smith. Where's Louis Jones? Look around and no, look behind you. See if there's a flag right along here. That's not there. Well, I wanted to tell you, Benjamin Smith. You see a little flag around here someplace? No, when I see a flag, I mean, no, 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 it's got to be right close by here. Well, let me read you Benjamin Smith's stone. It says, in memory of Benjamin Smith, and I know he's here someplace, so I wouldn't have it in my book, who was found dead in the Con River, meaning Connecticut oh. River, 10 September 1801, aged 66. He drowned while crossing the river. That happens today, right? People swim, well, they caught some guys that swam the river yesterday. What a nutcake. <laughs> but in any event, he kept taverns in North Hadley and Hadley. We call them gin mills now or something of that nature. In 1792, he married um, Irene Belding of Quakeman, and that was the one back there. That's the one that had 16 children, 109 greats, and 51 great greats. They were long winters back in those days. Well, I've got Benjamin here, but I'm sorry I can't locate him, so let's move on down here. This is Jones. These are slates. When you see this dark gray, you usually find that there's slates, and oftentimes they're very thin, and when a slate breaks, it is extremely difficult to do an adhesive repair that will hold. So oftentimes you'll find that people have taken uh, metal plates, drill holes through the brake on either side, run bolts through. Unfortunately, they used iron. What happens to iron? Rust. And that gets to be a real serious problem because when iron rusts, what happens to the diameter of the pin? It gets larger. That brings pressure against the stone and often it just cracks it. But they didn't have anything. Of, well, this is Captain Lewis Jones right over here. Yeah. He died 18th of August, 1817 AE. That's a Latin term, but at the age of 65. 
And oh, I found interesting by this stone here. See, it's Erin and Willow right here at the top. And on the side panels, see the side panels, there are columns. See the columns right there? On this side, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, sun's rays coming up on this side here. And down at the bottom, and this is, see all these marks across here? Mm -hmm. It's called bricking. Make it look like bricks. See? Yeah. It's, it, I know it's difficult to see, and if we had sunlight, we could see it much better. But that's uh, Captain Jones and here's his wife immediately adjacent. And one of the things that I thought was very interesting about this is that Mrs. Jones has a stone that's at least as good as her husband. And the same size, same inscription style, same iconography up here, and the same detailing down the side. And sometimes you find Mr. has this stone this is, has this stuff. <laughs> this is these right here? No, not the slates. Most of the time when we clean the slates, the slates uh, need to be cleaned if they have a biological growth on it. We call it lichens and moss. That's when we clean it. And on slates, we only use water. We do not use anything more than water. Actually, there's another Kodak product that we use, which is not harmful to slate. But you see all this red stuff on it? That's iron. That's in the stone. Don't try to take it off. It's useless. It's like getting a stain out of a white shirt, you know, after you put your pen, pen in there without the cap on it. It won't work. <laughs> this kind of thing here I've got to get to, because if you notice something here, this is not intentional on this tour, but you don't want children out in cemeteries playing. You don't want it to happen. Because what they'll do is, you know, they'll climb on a stone, you know, this way. And we have several situations where the stone came down <coughs> with the disastrous results, either death or permanent disability. And that's, that's bad news. So you don't want children at all unless somebody's holding their hand. Okay, we're going to skip on up here now. Here's our next uh, quiz midge. Mitch, do we know very much more about this family here, Thomas Gary or Jerry? How we pronounce G-E-R-R-Y? Gary. Gary. Thomas Gary was born. Notice this, born, they give a birth date. Many of the times they don't give a birth date, they give a death date and the number of years. And that's always interesting when you bring small, when you bring kids out here on field trips to have them use the arithmetic. And it won't get absolutely accurate because some, sometimes you'll see it 35 years, six months, and nine days. Then they can get a good birth date out of that. But most of the time, they can just get the birth year. But that's a, that's a good arithmetic problem. Well, this uh, folks here, his wife, Alice T. Smith, was born July 26, 1863. It was during the Civil War. Both incident killed in an auto at Hadley railroad crossing. Now was it a choo-choo train or was it a streetcar? It was a choo-choo train. It was a choo-choo train. Because <laughs> of, oftentimes they said killed by railroad car and it was a, a streetcar. You know, street car. But this was a railroad train and one of the interesting things that Midge noticed was um, it was 1910 and they died in an auto crash. What does that tell you? One of the first cars, and they had to have some money to buy a car, so there would be a fairly wealthy family. He he did have uh, he did have uh, the first car in North Hadley, and it was a uh, it wasn't run by gasoline. The first gasoline car was uh, by uh, Arthur Howe, mm -hmm. uh, who's buried just over there. Uh, the wife, Alice Smith, was of the famous Smith family there that had the tavern, uh, the tavern which is now owned by uh, the Boisforts and is a, a rental uh, house, but it's, it was a nice big tavern at one time. Uh, and they did have money, as you say, uh, and I don't know if Alice Smith paid for her husband's uh, 
car or not. <laughs> was she the wealthy one? She, she was the wealthy one. I, I don't know about him. Well, I kept looking and finally ended up with the wonderful so lady, Rosalie, but she didn't bring very much money to the marriage. <laughs> Okay, another thing that tells you wealth. What do you see here that tells you wealth? big stone. A hunk of rock. <laughs> and it's granite and it's very large. And even in 1910, when they were interred, this would have been a fairly expensive operation here. This is a very, very large stone. Fortunately, it's granite. And if we ever want to clean granite, there's not much you can do to hurt granite. So. But still, you always start when you're cleaning gray stone with water and a scrub brush, no matter what kind of stone it is. If that satisfies, then don't go any further. Otherwise, sometimes you come out with people with, uh, with uh, high pressure, either water or, uh, or with a grit of some kind in it to get the material off, but that takes some stone off when it does. So most of the time we use just very uh, liquid products. The name of the car was a locomobile. Locomobile? locomobile. Was it uh, an electric or a steamer? It was a steamer. A steamer. So a steamer encountered a steamer. <laughs> Let's step right up here just a moment, if you will. I had never heard that. This is an obelisk up on the base. And what I noticed over here, over here on this side. I encountered this first. Okay. The same inscription on here is the one over there. So all of this crowd was of the same family. George Smith, Nancy, George Atwood, Robert W. Smith. And Cotton and Smith, this was the grandfather, one of the first settlers here in North Valley. And his name was? Cotton Smith. Who is it? And then we have more inscription back here. So the entire family are shown on this particular monument. And all of these things here, we call them grave markers, not grave stones. Here's, you know, all his mother, father, James, John, Helen, Ellen. So all of these things are called grave markers. That's where the interments are. Mm -hmm. This particular thing is called a monument. And if you'll notice on this particular monument, it's the moss. When it's wet, it comes off much easier. And this are yellow or golden lichens. And all you need to do is to wet it and scrub it, and it's gone. And it should be done because this particular material here basically is parasitic. And, and for the lichens particularly, the lichens take moisture from the air with the acid that's in the air, and they use it to convert the stone into something that's edible for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the consequence is that they get into all these little pores and they just stay there until you get them out because this is a nice host stone for them. And so that's why we want to get it off. And we can get it off with ease, or you guys can. See all this stuff up here, it's not difficult to remove at all. But somebody has to do it. Can you use a brush on that? Absolutely. Another, another thing you can do is run a hose from over here. We, we don't have quite the pressure here that we do up at, uh, at Plainville for reasons I don't know, but bring it with a, with a, a nozzle on the faucet and turn the water full on and stand there and do this and most of it will come off and then you take your brush and finish it off. But it does need to be done. Once you get it off, how long does it stay that way before it starts to get back? Huh? It's sort of like washing dishes. <laughs> you know, well, how long has it been out here? I imagine within what you wouldn't have to worry about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it would be maybe 50 or 100 years before it appears in this kind of quantity. So, you know, don't worry about it. <laughs> right, just, just, just clean it up. You look all around here, it has other inscriptions here of the entire family. And I wanted to come around here on this side particularly. And so then this is uh, sandstone or brownstone. You might notice for people like myself, we look at 
I look at things to conserve and I look at things and look at the erosion here in this see this erosion here all along here so this intermediate cap right here incident that this is a multiple pieces there's one piece there's two piece there's three piece there's four piece there's five piece there's six piece there's seven piece there's eight piece about nine pieces to this stone and when we come around this side I want you to show you something here but this is Captain Caleb Smith. He died in Melbourne, Australia. May 12, 1854, at the age of 35. Young man, huh? Then Mary, his wife, died in San Francisco, California. July 9, 1853, aged 33. Just two years younger. Then Henry died soon after returning from Australia. And then John Smith, died January 12, 1871, age 50. He's in the last one. My guess is, Mitch, can you help us? Probably a sea captain. Most likely, most likely a sea captain. And when he was down in Australia, he contracted some kind of disease, he died there. His wife, of course, uh, being so close to him, would have, would have caught the same disease and so forth through the whole family. And so another thing, if you just come around here, I want to show one other thing. Um, Yep, don't stumble over a stone. <laughs> if you come right around here, I want to show you something. You need this is your line of sight up here. <laughs> Notice right here? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a crack. And it's gonna stay there and the wind's gonna blow. And it's gonna freeze. And one of these days, maybe not in our time that whole part is going to shale right off. So what you have to do, you have to stage it, you have to get up there and open the crack a little bit more with a tool, and then you get some, I got some material that's called the yawn mortar mixes, it's approximately the same color as this, approximately the same color, and do a fill on it. That'll keep the water uh, from freezing and thawing up there, but that, this is not unusual, and the way you test stones, any of you ever been to a watermelon patch? Uh, huh? Yeah. You know how to test a watermelon for ripeness? Yeah. You thump it. Yeah. We used to kneel on them. And you nailed them in the crack and knew they were ripe. But what, <laughs> what you do is you give them the watermelon test. You do this. And all of a sudden you hit a place and go, it's hollow behind me. Not here. But if you went up there and tapped on that on this side, it would, it would uh, echo, so you'd hear that it would be hollow. That co whole column is hollow. Big pardon? Is that whole column hollow? No. Hey, they moved hunks of rock around at you. <laughs> I mean, just bringing that one over here. And when you see some of the other monuments, earlier monuments, where they up 35 and 40 feet high, they just had rigging, and they did it. Are there any smiths? generations living now here anywhere? Any Smiths here? Any descendants? No, I mean, I, I mean, yeah. are there any that are related to these Smiths? That's what I'm asking. Yeah. Are you guys? I, I imagine Dr. Frank Smith uh, of Hadley, uh, who was Hadley's one doctor for years and years. Uh, I imagine that he was a, a descendant I know a story about the, the man who put up this monument uh, when uh, he was he not only ran the uh, the tavern but he had the grist mill here in North Hadley uh, and and his friend just up the street built the what we call a uh, uh, what? He, he ran, he owned and operated the sawmill, mm -hmm. and he wanted to put up a monument sort of like this, in, uh, and, and this uh, smith said, why don't you put it up here where my monument is? And uh, Lorenzo Granger, 
who, who was the owner of the uh, sawmill and a great entrepreneur for North Hadley uh, building and so forth, uh, he built it. He built his right down there. <laughs> See the tallest one over in the yeah. other corner? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's his monument. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's Build it on exactly the opposite side, diagonally. <laughs> By statute in the Commonwealth, there should be an American flag on every veteran's grave 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all year long. You notice there's some controversy, particularly in the Catholic cemeteries, where they want the flags removed. Down in Arlington, for example, flags are put on the graves only once a year for about a week. But here in the Commonwealth, in public cemeteries, this, this belongs to the town, um, we put the flags out and leave them all year long. <clears throat> One of the problems that we have is people know, so as Mids tells me, and there's a recitation, all of the names of the Revolutionary, Civil War, any war veterans here in the cemetery. But there is a problem. Where are they? And so when I came through to put flags on this time, I had to replace flags. Replace. And oftentimes you see um, an Odd Fellows. Odd Fellows, they have a little flag holder, and I find an American flag and an Odd, odd Odd Fellows or, um, or Knights of Columbus, and that doesn't say that that person wasn't a veteran, but if they were a veteran, it should be in a veteran's thing, you know, U.S. Army or something of this nature. So we have all kinds of mix, mix and match here, and we need to record every gravestone, what row there is, confirm the uh, status of the particular uh, person in terms of where they served in the military, and make sure that we have a flag holder there identified by row and stone number so that when each year comes and we put fresh flags, we can put them by veterans' graves. There hmm? at least appears to be a dearth of uh, Civil War my, uh, holder. Uh, G.A.R., Grand Army of the Republic, and there are a dearth of those, and now when you try to get them, Basically, what you get is this plastic widgy digi, which we'll show you over here, which is, uh, I think, terrible. Just awful to replace those cast iron. Down south, uh, where I'm reared in Savannah, Georgia, we have Maltese crosses, iron Maltese crosses, with um, with our um, soldiers' uh, dates of service on them. So now we're going to cross the road, and then cross the road. We want to go down here to cross because the the grade is much less uh, demanding. Uh, do we want to go over to Dot's grave? Oh, we can for just a moment. There's a GAR here. Oh. Grand Army of the Republic. It's cast iron. Its holder is still yes. nice and firm. You try to replace those. And you get this <clears throat> other stuff. Plastic? Yeah, plastic is really what. This is cast iron. Excuse me, what is that in the back there on the mother? Yeah. Help me, this right here? Yes. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted to say it's odd fellows but it wouldn't be appropriate. So I'll have to look up and see what that symbol is with an L in it. I don't know, but that's interesting. I'll show you another one over here that was interesting enough for me to find out what it was, but I hadn't particularly noticed that one. Uh, many of you remember Dot Russell. Some person said they couldn't find their grave at all. Well, Dot, Dot is in church right here. And he would have liked to have, have this going on here tonight. Uh, she did so much for the historical society and uh, liked all the people, all the people. And uh, so we're. 
Yeah, we, we really do need an We need um, a grave marker here for Dot. Mm -hmm. Now, well, I presume her name is going to be on there. Yes, her name will be on there. And, and, but we need a, a grave marker. Down here at the corner, for example, I, I conserved all of these jobbies here. These were all down. These are grave markers oh. for this little monument here. And the urn at the top was broken off here. Broken here and broken here. And I did adhesive repair on it and cleaned it about four years ago. Who was asking that question a few minutes ago? <laughs> the lady there? This was done about four years ago. So it's sort of like washing the dishes. What I wanted you guys to notice here is the, the plantings no. beside it. Uh, these plantings often, uh, LaSalle, is this LaSalle florist? No. no. Okay. Well, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to remove these. Because what's going to happen is pretty soon they're going to cover up the stone. And we have one in North Hadley that has this big thing, something like that, big thing like that. And I said, I drove by one day just a couple of weeks ago and I looked at it and said, I did not notice that before. This is an old handbook. And so I got out of the truck, left it running, went over and parted the material here like this. <laughs> Darn, or words like that, yeah. there is a gravestone in there. So I went around the back, crawled underneath and parted it. There's a whole list of the family. It's a huge granite and it's absolutely, totally obscured by the planning. So what we're going to do is remove this. Yes. This will need to be removed or trimmed back so sharply and kept trimmed back. Now who does that? That's the people that do the say, mowing yeah. are not going to mess around with these. That's not their job. Whose job is it? Nobody. Another son lives in Boston, uh, so I'll tell the Amherst son. Yeah, tell the Amherst son to come and get it trimmed back so far that it won't have any kind of contact with the stone. He lived to be 99, it says here, mm -hmm. 1892, 99 years old. Mm. Yeah. And what have we got here? This is symbol that tells you something? Right here? Uh -huh. Mason. 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 Mason, yeah. Wentworth Cemetery out in Colorado. No, it's uh, in the uh, most eastern part of uh, part of California, up, up on the hillock. And, you know, the, the stones are leaning and the coping is falling down and what have you. But about 90% of all the gravestones in there had the same thing. Okay, come right down here, folks. <laughs> now everybody's watching it. Come around this side, please. This particular stone here is for Frederick Russell, and I wanted to check and see if it was a tablet stone or if it was in a base. And you probe, and when you start stomping like that, you know that it's sitting in a base. And the reason it's leaning is right behind you. Mm, roots. The roots. Tree roots. The tree? Mm. roots. Trees yeah. are an absolute anathema. Yeah. Oh. When they fall, they <laughs> invariably fall on all the soft stones. Mm. When the tree roots come out, they start tipping them over. So when I start to reset this, there's one big root down there that's going to be chopped mm. in order to have the stone up. Frederick S. Russell died at Washington, D.C., October the 2nd, 1862, of wounds. Can you read it at all? Mm -hmm. Chantilly. Yeah. Wounds received in the Battle of Chantilly. Chantilly. Mm -hmm. He was 28 years of age. Mm -hmm. And the epitaph at the bottom, mm -hmm. can anybody read the epitaph? No. Oh, could. If, if we could. Oh, could. If, uh, oh, oh, could. We, we could, could but have but closed, have closed his, his eyes, eyes, received his, his parting breath. breath. And, and heard, heard him speak one kind of goodbye, goodbye before he slept in death. death. Mm. That's a parent speaking. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, this particular battle referenced here, Chantilly. Chantilly? 
It sounded French to me. Yeah. Well, it's about 35 to 40 miles absolutely directly west of, of Washington, D.C. Oh, nice. And here's what happened. <clears throat> At the Battle of Bull Run or Manassas, we Southerners called it one thing and the Yankees called it another. <laughs> and, and so in that first big battle, uh, Stonewall Jackson attempted to cut off this group uh, in which this guy was a soldier, tried to cut him off uh, and, uh, and take him prisoner, obviously. And this wide flanking march proved uh, to be, uh, start a, a real huge battle. And the consequence was that it was a draw, but we had, the Southerners had the strategic advantage. And the casualties on this particular thing here, let's see, estimated casualties, 2,100 men. The uh, Army of the Republic lost 1,300, and the Confederate States of America lost about 800. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a big battle. Yes, but it wasn't a big battle, and only two divisions, you know, wow. and something like 15,000 men on each side or something, give or take, mm. but when you get, you know, 100,000 in battles like get that, and Tatum or something, oh my get God, the casualties were just mm. horrendous. But I thought it was very interesting to go up yeah. on the website mm. and find out the Battle of mm. Chantilly. Yeah. Huh. I called Jones Library, she gave me the website, went up on the website, and there it is. Oh. All of this good stuff. It's in and Virginia, isn't it? I guess. Chantilly? Chantilly yes. Chantilly, Virginia. It, we, we call it Northern Virginia. Mm -hmm. oh. And yeah. the, the general who was uh, attempting to outflank this group was one uh, Stonewall Jackson. <laughs> the generals for the, uh, uh, the Grand Army of Public, both of them were killed in that battle. Mm -hmm. So casualties were severe. Every every Big Memorial Day. Both sides, more men died in the Civil War than any of our wars before or since. I suspect that that I read is that credible recently. and and curiously enough in the Revolutionary War and in the Civil War we call it something different down south. Uh, we call it the War of Northern Aggression. Mm -hmm. Inc incidentally, on both sides, it still lives. Yeah. It still yeah. lives today. And let me tell you, it lives down south and it lives up north. That right. whole, oh yes, you know, they have, have these encampments, right? Mm -hmm. And they relive and reenact. Mm -hmm. Down south, they do the same thing. <laughs> reenact. And so, the other two generals were for the... Um, the uh, Grand Army of the Public uh, were uh, killed in that battle, as I mentioned before. But so many of the casualties were a direct consequence of disease. It just so happened, I think it was in the Revolutionary War, that finally we appointed a person as, I, I'll call him Surgeon General, I've forgotten what the proper term was, and so he went out into the field where the armies were. And he said, guys, you really shouldn't be drinking and bathing in this water when your latrines are just upstream. I mean, fellas, uh, don't do that. And dig a hole and call it a latrine off here. And, and you're downriver. You remember they didn't have any uh, refrigeration, so they carried the cattle and the sheep and the goats and the hogs with them, and they dress them out. Well, they were dressing them out upstream. And even in the Civil War, there was a huge amount of loss of life due to disease. Once it started, mm. there was hardly any stopping. And and once one of those musket balls hit you and broke a bone, it was it was amputation. There was no way to cope with those situations. Um, a wound in the ab abdominal area, it was it was all over except for the pain. One other one I want to show you every, here. Every Memorial Day, uh, I get uh, one of the high school boys to read the list of veterans of all the wars. Uh, and there are uh, 31 veterans of the Civil War here. And what we've got 
do is find out exactly where they are. Mm -hmm. That's an important thing. One last I don't know if he's part of that Russell family. I'm not sure. Is he a relative, Midge? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. Probably this. Probably this Okay. The last stone I want to show you looks like it's a new plane on this right here. The flag flag. Somebody find my other flag. Can I go over there? Yes. Here we go. Here's here's one that I wanted to make sure that you saw and read. There's a weird one here. Notice this little symbol right here. It's a Maltese cross. And it says Women's Relief Corps. Corps 116 WRC, Women's Relief Corps, Mass Department. Massachusetts Department. So here's Mary E., wife of J.D. Miller, October the 6th, 1833, February 1st, 1918. Had something to do with the World War I, right? Let me look at the date there, 1918. <clears throat> no. This is an auxiliary to the Grand Army of the Republic, meaning yep. the Civil War, yep. called the Women's Relief Corps. And in 1883, they formed the Women's Auxiliary Corps for all of the men who were in Grant's army. Hmm? And it lives today. Would you believe that? It lives today. Their national headquarters is in New Durham, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And they describe here, it says, it has the distinction of being the only patriotic organization in existence founded solely on the basis of loyal womanhood, regardless of kinship, and through which any woman may, may render patriotic service to her country. And it describes this particular uh, symbolism here. Uh, I don't see it on this particular one, but it describes the symbolism the motto is fraternity, charity, and loyalty. Mm -hmm. So when I looked at that, I said, shucks in the bucket, that's World War I. Huh? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's a civil war. It lives, folks. It lives in New Durham, New Hampshire today. Okay. Mitch is going to tell us about uh, John Osborne here. Mitch, tell us about John Osborne here. Repeat your story. Osborne. Repeat it. repeat it? Yes, repeat it. Uh, well, John Osborne uh, was was a young man in his 20s when he helped Elam Cutter, who was the head carpenter for the church, uh, and John Osborne was his assistant, and the two of them uh, together built the whole North Hadley Church in 1834 and it's still standing and uh, we think they did a beautiful job. What was it first named? What was it first named? Ah, it Clicking, was... Clicking yeah. Second Congregation Church. First name, and then what happened? Uh, something Trinitarian. Trinitarian Congregational Church, I think it was. Well, I saw it in one place, I guess in Judge, it was, Judd, it was called Second, but it might have oh, it yes. might have gone through a well, metamorphosis into a number of names. Just not too long ago, it was Second Congregational. Uh, because First Congregational was down in Hadley, and that was its mother church. Uh, but we changed it recently to North Hadley. Mm -hmm. Congregational Church. Well, as we exit down here, we're going to show you a few more things, and then we'll be we'll, we'll have completed our tour. When you go into a cemetery, there's so many different things to look at: the iconography, the style of the gravestone, the epitaphs, the carving styles, the shape of the stones, uh, causes of death, uh, occupations. Um, like deacon or doctor or 
or other uh, symbolism representing occupations. So there's an awful lot that that people have left to be remembered by. These are very important and very sacred memorials. And one thing I want to tell you right now, a lot of us are getting close to that point at which we're going to depart this life. I mean, I'm 77 and some of you are 39 and what have you. But write your own epitaph. Because if somebody else it writes for you, you don't know what they're going to be doing for you. Uh, did you say anything about the little lamb down there? Oh, little, little lamb, that's a Victorian symbol. Uh, it's widely used, little lambs on the top for child, children's burials. <laughs> Here's an interesting stone here, George Henry, and it's, it, it tells you something. What does it tell you? It has a little indentation. What's this? The little thing sticking out, yeah, it's like a, it's a piano. piano. It's a piano. George Henry. He was the son of Nathan and Polly W. Clark. He died January 6, 1833. He's 19 years, 5 months, and 19 days. And there's an epitaph down here. See, oftentimes when the carvers did the epitaph, they did them in such small lettering. But I was able to read it, and it says this. As well the singers as the players on instruments shall be there. Oh, that's the epitaph. Oh, that's and this is, this is a well-carved stone, and if any of you ever walk up to a stone and you feel of it, and you find some bumps on it, let me see, not so pronounced here, but right here, they go the bump on it, what that tells you is there is something very important that was a little harder than the stone beside it, and this represents what? The effect of erosion. Sometimes they're standing out like this, which means that the stone has eroded very substantially. And that's what I'm saying. Stones are not forever. So the only way to preserve the record is written record, location record, and a photograph. And that's what we're going to do in the five Hadley cemeteries over the next two, two and a half, three years. It takes time to do this, folks. But we're going to do it. Right? We're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Do you okay. know who holds the records of the cemetery? Beg your pardon? Who holds the records of this cemetery? Uh, the town clerk. The origin of the record. The origin of the record was with the, with the custodian of the cemetery. And uh, that meant the information had to get from here back to town hall. And sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. This cemetery was not laid out in plots. There are no plot markers. North Had Old Hadley was not laid out, except the eastern end, which was set aside in 1908, and it is set aside in plots. This is not set aside in plots. There are little squares and names scribbled in them, and a lot of times they're in ink, which is faded, we have a major job in recording all of the information here and checking it against the town hall records. Yes, we do. Is that designated as a road? This one? The burials in here now. And as a matter of fact, the, uh, this particular place, you can just stay right there. You can go ahead and see this little stone. You guys can stay right there. Wally Hibbert was able to tell me that this space here wasn't taken, yeah. and it is now. Oh. This is the Freeman plot. Uh -huh. But somebody belongs to this, and somebody belongs to that, and so the carriage road has now been utilized. That's what I mm -hmm. yeah, see way down at the far end, Jim? Yeah. Origin okay. Originally it wasn't. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, last little bit I want to show you guys. One of the problems that I found when I first got here, a lot of these stones were leaning and like down there and they're leaning away from the roadway. Can you guess why that was? Winter burials. Snow. Bring a snow plow in. 
and the snow plow blows the snow against the gravestones. And year after year after year after year, and snow after snow after snow, and so that's why a lot of them were leaning, and some of them were broken. See right there? Okay, as we exit here, I just wanted to show you this stone briefly here. This is a stone made of granite. Oh, Susie. Susie. Louisa at home. Jerusha. The fact of the matter is her death date is 1847. This is likely a replacement stone. It's made of granite. And you find very few stones in here made of granite with that date on it, so it's probably a replacement stone. We have a whole bunch of them up in Old Hadley, replacement stones, because it was so badly. What's Don't at you? the bottom there? It looks like it was dug out. Where's that? Oh, no, it's just grass. Excuse me. <laughs> well, no, I haven't been here. <laughs> Would you guys just line up along here for me? So you can look at me this way. You guys just line up along here and just look at me this way here. This stuff here is, we call this iconography or pictures on the stone here. And this is a draped harp. Isn't that nice? It's in relief. So that's a, that's a nice little, little symbol on this particular stone. Uh, this particular stone over here it's very gothic. This, this is very gothic. It was repaired during WPA days. They used sand cement, what they had, and it works fine. Look at this one right here, a little small stone. So this where a child just stand right there now. This stone right here is not particularly distinguished, you know, in terms of iconography. This one right here is an open book. It's obviously more of a ministerial type, meaning the Bible. And what I really wanted you to see was this. That stone, this stone, this stone, this stone, and this stone, four days ago, looked like this stone. Mm. And there's hose attachment right there. <laughs> Wet the stone thoroughly. That means drench it. That means wet it. And you always start cleaning on the back and the sides and the top. Then you clean the front. Because most of the time volunteers come and they want to clean the front and then they want to go home. Well, on the top of this thing there's moss and on the back there's lichens and soil and what have you. So you always want them to do the unseen part first. <laughs> because if they do the front first, they're done. And let me tell you, I've had experience where they are done. <laughs> so you see the difference. It took me about an hour to do that stone, that stone, that stone, that stone, that stone. And I used water first and then I used S H calcium hypochlorite. It's the stuff you throw in a pool. Mm -hmm. Calcium. What are these made of? Limestone. What are these made of? Limestone. It's calcium. Oh, calcium in there. Yeah. It's, it's calcium. Mm -hmm. Limestone. And what it is, the binder is calcium, and it has all kinds of little sand particles in it. Mm -hmm. So if you take a glass and look very closely, you know, at this, you see the little granular substances. So this stone here has a lot of porosity. Oh boy, great word, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Porosity. Mm -hmm. And you see how these little ridges are here? Mm -hmm. That tells you that over this period of time, we've lost maybe, I, I can't measure in millimeters, but a little bit of stuff. Maybe uh, a 30 second of an inch. I still am inches. But you can see we've had loss there. You can see that uh, we've had loss here on the back more than the front. And so what I'm really trying to say is if we want this cemetery to to show that the, anybody who comes in here that the community respects this memorials to the people who were important to this community and actually made it, then we've got to do something about it. And ignoring it is not doing something about it.
So we need some work done, and right behind you there's another open book. See the little Bible right here? Probably a Bible. Israel, right here. And over here, uh, let's see, where's it right here? Where's the little, it's right here, the child, the drill stores. It's called Very Victorian. Very Victorian. Lambs, children. And up in, I remember seeing one up in, um, in Vermont where there's a child's bed with a pillow on it and the covers are just turned back. Oh. And I was standing there one day and this couple came, they were looking over the gray stones, they said, gee, what? where's the child? Oh. And I looked at him and I said, what does the turn back coverlet say to you? And they said, the child's gone. You got it. Child is gone. And it, it, you know, you stand there and you can almost weep over it. <coughs> you go look at those little gravestones over there, three or four children died, you know, one right after another. Mm -hmm. Bang, 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 bang. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really is a very telling experience. Well, this concludes the tour. I did want to demonstrate to you um, what scrubbing does to a stone, and I want another 30 seconds of your time. <coughs> to clean the stone out here, here's what you do. First of all, you dry brush. <laughs> Sometimes you dry brush and the result is you can read the stone. If you can read the stone and it doesn't have a lot of biological growth on it, leave it alone don't need to mess with it. I'm going to violate my first principle. I'm going to clean a little piece on the front so you can see it. <laughs> you always test the stone to make sure it's stable. Very important. You don't stand in front of the stone to mess with it, <laughs> except to record it. But sometimes they're not stable. So you always work on the side. First of all, you just wet it. You're pretty, pretty involved, isn't it? Very technical. <laughs> Rub it up, down. <laughs> Oftentimes when you do this, you see some inscription down here. Well, in this particular instance, it looks like the epitaph is right here. So we just do that. Always work. You always paint from the top down, scrub from the bottom up. Of course, you're not going to be painting these, but but that's that's just like that righty tighty lefty loosey. <laughs> we men call it standard bolts tightened to the right. <laughs> Unless there's crazy people in Chrysler, sometimes 20 or 25 years ago, for the lugs on the tires on the car. Yeah. Yeah, right, left. They tighten to the left. Yep. And I had a Chrysler, and I'm trying to change my tire. <laughs> <laughs> I had the same experience. <laughs> so, what you do is make sure it's wet. One of the advantages we have here is that you have a water source right behind you. And if you don't, you fill buckets. I use um, milk jugs. I drink lots of milk. And I just take water in the milk jugs. And for each stone of this size, it's taking about five gallons of water to clean this down. Oh. And if this didn't give me the result that I wanted, then I would use the calcium hypochlorite. And it does have a little bit of bleach in it. And after the sun hits it, it makes a huge difference in the appearance of the stone. See, a lot of this stuff is just soil. And you always know that you're going to get wet, you're going to get dirty, and, but you can still have the pleasure of, can you read who this might be? L-A-U, Lorana, Lorana, see, L-A-U, R-A, Laura, 
M U N R O. Looks like A G. And sometimes it's difficult to read and make a mud pie. Yeah. Don't <laughs> harm anything. And if I can get it, a little bit of it to stay there. D E T Daniel. Daniel. L A U R A. A. Laura. 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 Daniel. Daniel, something of that nature. What does it say? Daughter? My yeah. wife says it's denial. <laughs> well, really, really, I, I remember the old guy. Oh, wow. D E N I O. Maybe not that one. But you see, when you get to a particular point like this, when the soiling stops coming off, then you've done all you can do with this particular process. See the soiling coming off of it still? And so I'll come out here and finish it. <laughs> yep. Hey, you've got water right behind you. Once some years down at the Cape, I had to go down to a brook mm -hmm. and get water. Mm -hmm. You get it from anywhere. Yeah. We had a great stone conservation in Leicester, and uh, the guy who I met accidentally was also with the fire department, and the police department was also the parking commissioner. <laughs> and we needed water, so what he did, he brought the fire engine. Right up, hooked, uh, hooked it up to a fire hydrant, no problem, plenty of water. Pumped it right up, filled the cans, and when I was over in Hatfield some years ago, they took the big cover off and put a little cover on it with a, with a regular hose attachment to it. We hooked a hose to it and ran it out into the cemetery. It works, but it, uh, and in the morning sun, you can read this better. The afternoon sun gets the sunlight, rake it, and you can read it like it was done yesterday. Mm -hmm. I promise you it will. So, and we, since we have plenty of water, we don't spare the water. And there we have it, folks. Uh, Laura, thank you. Your North Haley Cemetery, which is going to get a lot of attention.